Dear colleagues, it gives me a great pleasure and honor to contribute to this conference. My name is Jürgen Hermes. I work in the Di Department of Digital Humanities at the University of Cologne. And I have been working uh, with the Voynich Manuscript for over 13 years now. This conference is an opportunity for me to bring my work, which I already did 10 years ago as part of my dissertation, closer to the non-German speaking audience. The title of my presentation is Polygraphia 3, the cipher that pretends to be an artificial language. And I will try to give you the most important aspects in a short form. You can read more details in my contribution. I will first briefly highlight some of the real crude features of Voynichis and why they make it so difficult to classify this text. Ultimately, these characteristics led one of the greatest crypto analysts of the last century, William F. Friedman, to come to an assessment that has also its problems. My contribution is intended to point out a possible solution to some of these problems by introducing a relatively old cipher of a German abbot, uh, Johannes Tritemius. And my experiments can show how an application of the cipher could generate a text that comes very close to the statistical properties of Voynichis. I will end with some concluding remarks, what I'm claiming, and more, what not. I think most of you know about the strange and odd features um, of the text in the Voynich manuscript, and so I can only list a few here. Uh, let's start with the distribution of word lengths. Um, even if we count the types, we can see that the, their lengths in Voynichis here in red and blue are binomially distributed. And this differs significantly from all known Central European languages. Here we have three examples, a German text of Paracelsus, an English text from D, and an ancient um, Latin text from Caesar. This difference um, can be seen in the token lengths even better because natural languages tend to use short words, or short words much more often than long ones. Um, the distribution becomes extremely left skewed, much more in some languages like German, uh, here extremely um, Paracelsus and uh, English, um, less in Latin. Um, but the length of tokens in Wallachies remains binomially distributed. Okay, let's come to the entropy, or more preciously, the joint entropy. Here, the Wallachies has values that cannot be found in any natural language. Ultimately, this is very difficult to explain, but perhaps this image helps. Um, it is much more likely that one can predict the next letter in the Voynich text than one can do so in any other language. It's uh, as the dice for Voynichis has just fewer sides. Uh, the third weird property I want to mention here is the repetitiveness of the text. Uh, many words in the Voynich manuscript look very similar. Sometimes the same word is used several times in a row. This is at least very untypical for natural languages. Here we have a relatively well-known example from folio 78R, which reads Kukidi, Kukidi, Shedi, Chedi, here in the upper row, in the lower row, Kukal, Otedi, Kukidi, Kokedi dal, Kokedi Kokedi argam. In the EFA transcription, of course. Uh, can you imagine a sentence in any language that's a, that is that repetitive? The problem with the combination of these properties is that one of these cannot be a transcription of a natural language, and no cipher has yet been found that can produce a similar text. Many have tried to find an explanation for this, and William Friedman, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, crypt cryptanalyst of the last century, published his own hypothesis. I put no trust in anagrammatic acrostic ciphers, for they are of little real value, a waste, and may prove nothing, finis. Before we think too much about this, I should mention that this is an N anagram, um, and um, his wife uh, did resolve this uh, several years after his death, um, and the anagram 
um, means uh, the Voynich manuscript was an early attempt to construct an artificial or universal language of the a priori type Friedman. I think I have to make a brief digression on artificial languages a priori. Um, compared to artificial uh, languages a posteriori, they were not designed on the model of natural languages, instead they function on the basis of other principles. And because of this, they have completely different properties. And this is the reason why Friedman comes up with the idea that one and cheese could be such a language. One of the most famous and earliest a priori language designs is John Wilkins' real character from the 17th century. The design is epistemologically motivated. Uh, Wilkins wanted to develop a language in which similar meanings can be expressed by similar characters. Uh, here we have the Apostle, uh, Apostles' Creed in real characters. Here in the, in the first row and in, in the fifth. Uh, and then we have a lot of numbers. And then we have a phonetic transcription of the real characters. And um, finally an English translation in the fourth row. I cannot go into details, but I can show by two examples what is meant by similar characters for similar concepts. Here we see the characters for heaven and earth, which are very similar because they are related concepts, uh, at least for Wilkins. Earth has only one additional line on the right side here. And next example, uh, you can see uh, the principle, uh, the same principle in the Trinity. Yeah, God the Father, here Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost uh, differ only by the angle of the line on the left edge of the character. Uh, they are also pronounced similarly. Um, dab, dat, and duck. So all in all, Friedman's hypothesis is nice, but unfortunately not unproblematic, because the earliest universal language designs of Wilkins and Dalgano, who invented Arthignorum, it's another a priori system, are basically far too systematic to produce a rather wild text like the Wannichis. Moreover, they were drafted in the advance of the 17th century, while, as far as we know, the Wannich manuscript is definitely older. It's fairly certain um, that it was in Prague at the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, we will hear more on this in the lecture uh, tomorrow. And um, that the parchment dates from the 15th century. And I don't want to hide here that uh, what I am about to present um, is not an ultimate solution to this problem. But um, we are at least moving a whole period closer to the time of the manuscript's creation when we take a look at the cryptographic work of, uh, works of Johannes Tritemius. Tritemius was a German Benedictine abbot and a polymath and lived in the transition between the Middle Ages and the early modern period. His Polygraphia from 1506 was the first ever printed book on the subject of cryptology, although it was already Tritemius' second book on this subject, for he wrote the Steganographia six years earlier. However, the Steganographia's arcane characteristics were so incompre incomprehensible to the public, in including representatives, uh, representatives of the Catholic Church, that it was placed on the Index for, uh, of Forbidden Books for more than 250 years. Within his uh, Steganographia, Tritemius developed a series of procedures that hide and in some cases uh, additionally encrypt secret messages in non-suspicious looking texts. The procedures described in the Steganographia are based on the fact that the letters of the plain text occur at specific um, positions of the ciphertext and the rest was filled with notes. This comes with a great deal of effort for the creator of the message because he or she has to self-invent an extremely large amount of insuspicious text. With the procedures introduced in the Polygraphia, Tritemius attempts to limit this effort. In the first two parts of the poly Polygraphia, Tritemius shows how to camouflage a plain text within a Latin prayer. 
uh, without speaking a one, one word of Latin, of course, um, just by replacing uh, individual letters of the plain text with Latin words. The words are arranged in uh, substitution tables in a way that the cipher text appears syntactically and semantically coherent. You can see the first six columns of the Polygraphia 1 here. Um, if we use this table to encode the word secret, we have to choose um, the word for S from the first column. It's here. Here it's conservator. And the word for E from the second, uh, here Magnus, and C from the third, uh, conserv conservance, and so on. Um, so, at the end, um, we get a whole sentence for one word of our plain text. Um, so, secret here uh, in uh, Polygraphia 1 cipher is Conservator Magnus, Conference, Cuncta Justus, Suis in Feliciabus, Amen. Uh, Suis in and Amen are nouns that have to be added before and after the sixth column. You can see this here. Uh, I hope this example, example illustrates why this cipher is called Ave Maria or Hail Mary cipher, since the cipher text tends, tends to look like a Latin prayer. Within the third part of the Polygraphia, Tritemius maintains the principle of, re of replacing individual letters with whole words. But he uses no longer Latin words as substitution ciphers, but words that he invented especially for this purpose. He makes use of features of natural languages which appear as if the same stem had been inflected in different ways. Here you can see the first page of the Polygraphia 3 cipher and the table where I added the first seven columns of um, 132 in Omnis. Tritemius intended that one creates the cipher text as in the Ave Maria cipher, that is, using each column in the order given. For our plain text word secret, we get Abril, Madu, Badil, Kadalea, Pazu, Ador using this method. But since there is no connection of meaning between these fantasy words, um, we are actu uh, actually free to choose um, the words that we want. We only have to um, take care that we are in the right, uh, in the right row. In this, this example here, I encrypted cheese um, using only ciphers from the column 5. Uh, the result is Pazi, Pazin, Pazu, Pazu, Pazil, Pazu. And maybe this reminds you of something we have seen before. Of course, in the history of Ronit research, it has often been the case that someone feels reminded of something. I have therefore con conducted a scientific investigation in this that is described in detail in my dissertation and uh, still awaits review by other scientists. My hypothesis is the application of a cipher that works according to the principle of Polygraphia 3 produces a text with similar properties to text in Vonnegut's. Um, I have tried to falsify it with the following experiment. I generated texts by simulating encryptions with the Polygraphia 3 cipher and compared these texts to medieval and early modern texts of different languages and to the Voynich manuscript. I make no secret of the fact um, that I have not, su not succeeded in really imitating all the characteristics of Voynich's. I see the, the problems mainly in implementing a comprehensible selection process for the ciphers. Uh, future research could start with having real people as encryptors, for example. Um, nevertheless, I have results and I would like to present them here. Let's start with the word length. We see that the Polygraphia 3 cipher, here in blue, also produces a specific dis distribution that differs from those of nat natural languages. It is not binomially distributed yet, but this could be achieved by aligning the ciphers in the substitution tables without changing their semantics. Even more striking, however, is that in natural languages, the curves for types and tokens are far apart, since uh, they become very left-skewed with the tokens. And this is 
definitely not the case for Voynichis and it's also definitely not the case for the Polygraphius recipher. Let's look at the entropy. Um, please focus on the row with the joint entropy H2. Uh, we see very low values for H2 for Voynichis and with uh, the P3 encryption the value is lower than uh, with natural languages but definitely larger than with uh, Voynichis. Uh, however, this can be changed if the selection process is not applied to all 132 columns of the P3. That's what I've done here in the P3 big. Um, but only to 10 columns. Um, this is um, what I've done uh, with PC small. There you can see that the H2 value is even lower than in the Voynich manuscript. Of course, this is not in accordance with the rules because we only get a total of uh, 240 uh, possible types. But it shows that with the manipulation of the selection process, strong deviations can be absorbed here. We come to repeatability and the possible measures for it. In my experiments, I counted direct word repetitions and minimal pairs for this purpose. Minimal pairs here are two consecutive words that only differ in one letter. For minimal triplets, this applies to three consecutive words. What we see are very high values for Voynichis emphasize the special nature of this text. It uh, can also be seen that the Polygraphia 3 ciphers have increased values, which can be raised almost arbitrarily if a few replacement columns are used here in the P3 small. And here too, future research should demonstrate to what extent other selection procedures in ciphering produce more realistic results. I think the experiments demonstrate that a cipher that replaces individual letters with invented words that are very similar to each other has the potential, in contrast to natural languages, to approximate the statistical properties of energies. What this study still lacks is a simulation of a comprehensible selection process that can mimic a medieval encryptor. I come to the last part of my talk. Since I seem to have caused confusion for at least one of the reviewers, I would like to emphasize once again what I am not claiming. So, I don't think that Tritemius is the author of the Voynich manuscript. He would probably be too young for that too. I am sure that the Voynich manuscript is not a plain text letter, but possibly encrypted, that might be. But I am only giving a hint that it could be an, an encrypted text, but my evidence is far too thin to consider it certain. And I don't think that it was likely that the Voynich manuscript was encoded with a code book, since such a book has never been found and, moreover, could only have been used at enormous expense. So I don't even think that I have made the best attempt yet to generate a text with the properties of the Voynich manuscript. But I think, how could the text with the crude characteristics of the Voynich manuscript have been created is still a key question in the Voynich research. And I think that previous attempts to explain a natural language or a known cipher as the basis for the generation were not convincing. What we have is a method for generating meaningless text, it's known as the autocopist theory, that is comprehensible, at least in my opinion, but, well, it produces only meaningless texts. And knowing that there were encryption methods in the late medieval times that look like an artificial language and that could produce a text with properties similar to a Voynich's text at least keeps alive the hope for hidden information in, our, in the famous manuscript of us all. Not? So in the end, I would like to say thank you, or in Polygraphia's Rig, Abril, Pazin, Paza, Puzzle, Pazum, Paza, Kadalur, Loros. And I'm looking forward to your questions.